This is Debunking Anti-Catholic Myths, Part 1. So this is a two-part series, and this will be our, our last in the general subject of historical apologetics. Um, and the, uh, the next test will, will be on this part, next part, um, and the last thing that we did, which was the Inquisitions. So what are anti-Catholic myths? Well, basically, they are uh, false history. And uh, unfortunately, these false historical myths are very pervasive. Um, you'll see them in most of the mass media. You'll see them in many so-called history textbooks. And uh, what I've done is I've gone to qualified historians who have set the record straight. And I've put a bunch of direct quotes in here. And of course, all the sources can be checked. But the reason that anti-Catholic myths get started and, and perpetrated um, is because of, well, it's because there are plenty of people out there who are A, anti-Catholic and willing to believe lies about the church. And this really goes back to the black legend, which we talked about last uh, last unit in the Inquisition. But um, it's not only the black legend, it's just gen a kind of general anti-religiousness, especially um, anti-Catholicism that, uh, that plagues our world. Now, in defense of the church, uh, it must be said from the outset that no other institution in the world has contributed as much as the Catholic Church to human rights, international law, education, social services, and organized charity. And this is um, just a fact. I mean, it, that doesn't even depend on, on some history textbook. Uh, look at all the hospitals, um, look at all the religious orders that were founded to help the sick, uh, look at all the schools that were started uh, by Catholic religious. Uh, the, the church is the world's major force uh, for good. And if you look at, at charity and helping the poor and the amount of money given to the poor by the church and by church organizations, it's, uh, it, it leads the world. So th those are not subjective facts. Those are just objective, real, data-based facts. Okay, so let's get into what the myths are. So, mainstream media history has most people believing the following four things. One, the church supported the persecution of Jews since they were the ones who crucified Christ. Two, the Dark Ages were a time of ignorance and barbarism perpetuated by an oppressive church. Three, the church supported slavery. And four, Catholic missionaries in the New World forcibly converted the indigenous peoples and suppressed their culture. Now, um, it's going to take a while to get through all four of these myths. That's why I'm splitting, I'm splitting the video up. So um, this video will cover the first two myths, and uh, next week's video will cover the following two myths. All right, anti-Semitism, the accusation that the church is against Jews because they killed Christ. Well, how did this start? It actually started before the black legend. Um, and you could say that, that one reason people have thought this or that the accusation was able to get started is because there are things in the New Testament that seem to indicate it. I put three of them here. Uh, Matthew 27, 24 to 26, this is when Jesus is being tried before Pilate. And uh, Pilate says, this man is innocent. I'm innocent of his blood. And the Jews say, his blood be on us and on our children. Okay, that's what the, the crowd says. Um, Matthew 23, 37, uh, this is Jesus lamenting over Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. Or John 5, 16 to 18, um, when Jesus is starting to incur the opposition 
and hatred of his enemies. For this reason, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Well, I think it's clear to most of us who, uh, who know the Gospels that this is not an indictment of the Jewish people in general. This is an indictment of the enemies of Christ. And it's, that's simply true. Those are the people who, who killed Jesus, um, his Jewish enemies, who enlisted the help of the Romans. Uh, Jesus had plenty of Jewish supporters. Okay, so this is really nothing against the Jews. Uh, it's just that the Gospels are historical. And, and the people who got him killed were Jews. But that doesn't mean that the Jewish people as a whole are guilty for his death. Um, it's it's not uh, it's not even it's not even clear from reading the Gospels just without other information uh, that that um, the church is anti-Semitic. What is clear from reading the Gospels and only the Gospels is that Jesus had enemies <clears throat> who happened to be Jews. Now. The real accusations against the church for anti-Semitism began with um, the People's Crusade in 1096. Now, we talked about this um, in an earlier unit when we, were when we were discussing the Crusades. And I mentioned the People's Crusade, which was this ragtag, rag this organized bunch of... Um, men, women, and children, and some soldiers who, who set out for the Holy Land under the leadership of Peter the Hermit. And um, most, of them, most of them died on the way, and those who arrived were defeated. So we don't really even count this in the official, in the official eight crusades. This immediately preceded the first crusade, and... Uh, it did result in in some in some looting of uh, predominantly Jewish towns. Now, um, does that mean the church is anti-Semitic? Well, of course not, because first of all, uh, this was a disorganized group. Um, it was it was not commissioned directly by the church. The first crusade was, but not not this miserable attempt. And so um, we can't just we can't just point the finger at the church and say, "Oh, church is anti-Jewish because some of these miserable people in this ragtag bunch happen to loot Jewish towns." That doesn't really hold up. But besides that, all right. Besides that, if you're going to accuse the church of anti-Semitism, well, the honest question to ask yourself is, what about the first thousand years of Christianity? Okay. Because 1096 is a long time after after Christianity began, and where where are the documented historical attacks against Jews perpetrated by the church? Well, they're not they're not there because they didn't happen. Okay, so so this whole thing about anti-Semitism, even even just the timeline, is unfair. Okay, let's go to. Um, Let's go to uh, a real, a really troublesome chapter in the Crusades, which we talked about before. And again, as I said before, this was not condoned by the church. It was done by an evil man and evil men who cooperated with him. He didn't have permission. Um, there, there were a lot of things about this that would prevent us from, from blaming the church for his actions. But these actions happened, so let's talk about them. So Count Emico of Leiningen, and this was the same year as the People's Crusade, 1096. Um, the official first crusade had been launched, um, and those crusaders were already on their way east. And uh, that included, that included um, Count Emico's duke, who was the person in charge. And he himself was under uh, the German emperor, Henry IV, at the time. And um, the duke had gone off to the east uh, to fight in the crusade, and he had left Count Emico in charge. Now, we discussed Count Emico earlier, but I'm just going to uh, 
go into a tiny bit more detail right now. So Emiko of Leiningen um, was clearly anti-Semitic and he used, he used this as an excuse. He said that he wanted to slaughter Christ's enemies in the West before marching off to fight them in the East. Now, he did not have the Duke's permission for this. Um, the Duke never said, oh, I want you to kill Jews. He, um, he had explicit orders from the Emperor, Emperor Henry IV, to, to leave Jews alone. Henry IV had issued that decree um, precisely against this type of thinking. But Emiko uh, disregarded all of that and, and um, decided to go on a rampage of slaughter. I'm sure he already had a chip on his shoulder against the Jews for whatever reason, but, um, but the results were unfortunate. So first he went to Spire. Now, um, he limited his attacks to the Rhine and the Moselle Valleys. Uh, and in the Rhine Valley, there are five main towns. We're going to see how he attacked all of them. So when he got to Spire, um, the bishop had been alerted that he and his forces were on their way. And he protected most of the Jews in his palace. He gave them safe haven in his palace. Um, now, of course, it's impossible to round up everybody. It's amazing that he rounded up all but 12. Uh, but unfortunately, those 12 who were uh, not able to get to the palace in time, uh, they perished. Then he went to Worms, and the Bishop of Worms tried. Um, he also gathered the Jews into his palace, but uh, Emiko broke in and killed 500 Jews. He then went to Mainz, Cologne, and Metz, in which uh, the same thing happened as in Worms. That is, Bishop tried, but, um, but Emiko used force to break in and kill. Then he went on to the Moselle Valley, and um, Emiko by this time had learned to avoid bishops because bishops got in the way. I mean, look, right there is a great defense of the church, okay? Because not only was he doing this without permission, and um, neither civil permission from his duke uh, and the emperor. So he didn't have that. And of course he didn't have church permission. But here we see, here we see Catholic bishops um, putting their own lives at risk by protecting Jews in their home. So the charge of anti-Semitism is completely unfair. So Emiko attacked only towns that had no resident bishop and this allowed him to kill several thousand Jews because they had no one to even try to protect them. Now, a couple of other counts, Volkmar and Gottschalk, did the same in Prague and Regensburg. Um, and they did this basically because they were inspired by Emiko to do it. Now, <clears throat> gotta love the Hungarian knights because the Hungarian knights were some badass warriors who were um, really good on horseback. And that really goes back even to uh, the original days of, of the Huns. You know, the Hungarians like to trace their, their lineage uh, even to the ancient Huns who were amazing, um, ama amazing horseback warriors. Well, the Hungarian knights who were loyal to the Pope, loyal to the church, and loyal to Emperor Henry IV, um, they, they went out and utterly defeated these Jew-hating criminals. And, um, and, and the forces of, of Volkmar and Gottschalk proved to be no match, and so did Emikos. So um, uh, you could say that, uh, you know, they, they, they brought it upon themselves. They had it coming. Um, they went slaughtering innocent people, and the Hungarian knights slaughtered them. Now, Pope Urban II, who had launched the First Crusade, vehemently condemned these attacks. And uh, of course he did, because, you know, they, they were not launched by the church, and they were completely the opposite 
of what the Crusades were about. The Crusades were about uh, liberating the land where Christ was born uh, and had nothing to do with killing Jews. Another sad chapter in this whole saga of supposed church anti-Semitism, which as we can see is not church anti-Semitism, but is um, the anti-Semitism of a few crazy people who, um, who use religion as an excuse. It's not the religion's fault, it's their fault. And the next crazy was Radolf the Monk. Now this was 1146, which was uh, the time of the Second Crusade. And Radolf the Monk, uh, inspired by Emigo, uh, and I'm sure he had the chip on his shoulder already, something against the Jews. Um, he started to he started to do massacres of the Rhineland Jews, just as Emiko had. He went to the same five towns that we've already named, those same five Rhine Valley towns. Uh, his reason was the same, killing the enemies of Christ in the West before uh, going on to kill Christ's enemies in the East. And again, he had no permission whatsoever to do this. No permission from the state, no permission from the church, and yet he still went about doing it. Now, St. Bernard of Clairvaux put an end to the slaughter. So uh, it's kind of interesting to know how um, the one who stopped Emiko and his cronies, um, well, the ones who stopped him were the Hungarian knights and stopped him by force. St. Bernard of Clairvaux, his, his influence in the world was such that he didn't even need to resort to violence. Um, Clairvaux was the most brilliant scholar and preacher of his time. He was uh, very eloquent. He held crowds spellbound for hours. He was very convincing. And he was clearly a saint. His, his holiness was evident. Just the force of his, of his personality uh, and his charisma was enough to put an end to the slaughters. So he tried by letter when he first heard about it, but when when he heard that it hadn't stopped, he actually traveled out there to the Rhine Valley, um, and you know, put put all of these anti-Semitic Jew killers uh, in their places, basically shamed them into stopping, which they did. Now there were uh, again five Rhine Valley attacks. And I'm not talking about five towns. Uh, I'm talking about five Rhine Valley attacks on those five towns uh, in the 13th century. But this was more due to political instability. It was the fact that um, there was kind of a kind of an anarchy at the time. There there were a lot of um, minor lords and dukes, and there wasn't any unity, and so things got out of hand easily. But again, that's not the church's fault. The church has never ever wanted massacres of Jews. Then again, there was the Black Death in 1347 when it, when it started, and Jews were accused of poisoning the wells. There was a big conspiracy theory. Um, and, and of course, we know now that, uh, you know, that it didn't have to do with poison water. It had to do with rats and fleas. But uh, it was easy to point the finger at the Jews because um, there were plenty of people who looked at them with distrust. And, and, and frankly, I think a lot of anti-Semitism is based on jealousy. Because if you look at the Jews throughout history, um, because they are a united and smart people and, and, and devout, the Jews have always achieved success. They've been great bankers, great businessmen, great scientists. That has always been true, and it's even true today. And part of that, I think, is because they've always been blessed by God. You know, uh, Yahweh promised blessings upon the Israelites, and he's never, he's never withheld those blessings. He doesn't go back on his promises. And I think a lot of anti-Semitism is caused by jealousy. Um, in any case, the sporadic Rhineland attacks uh, ensued. So these poor Rhineland Jews are getting picked on all the time. Now, Pope Clement IV issued a poll. Uh, denouncing the poisoned well theory. 
and excommunicating the attackers. But the problem persisted until the early 15th century. Now we can imagine that that many of these attackers did incur excommunication, but um, unfortunately, in spite of the bull, uh, it didn't it didn't stop their problems. Again, I, I think it I think there's abundant evidence for us to see that neither the Gospels nor the church condone anti-Semitism. Now, here is what I think, uh, I think it's the ugliest and most insidious attack uh, on the church as far as false history goes. And that is this notion of Pope Pius XII as Hitler's Pope. And, um, you know, you can do a Google search for stuff like Pius XII and the Holocaust, or Pius XII and the Jews, or the Catholic Church and the Holocaust, and things. You do Google searches like that, you know what you're going to see. You're going to see all kinds of stuff out there about how the church did nothing to stop the Holocaust, and Pius XII just sat back silent, and blah, 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 and look at how anti-Semitic the church is. This is pure hogwash, okay? It's pure hogwash because the truth is completely the opposite. It's completely the opposite. And I am going to show you so much evidence for this. So Pius XII was praised by Jews for saving their lives during World War II. Okay, this is just a fact, um, and I'll show you quotes in a minute. But, but the, the fact is that these Jews that Pius XII and the church are accused of hating are the very ones who thanked Pius XII and thanked the Catholic Church immediately uh, after World War II because of all that he had done for them. So let's look at this quote. Um, 1943, Chaim Wiseman, who went on to become the first president of Israel. He wrote, the Holy See is lending its powerful help wherever it can to mitigate the fate of my persecuted co-religionists. Okay, that was still during the war. 1944, Rabbi Israel Zoli, the chief rabbi of Rome. The Vatican has always helped the Jews, and the Jews are very grateful for the charitable work of the Vatican, all done without distinction of race. The Pope and the Vatican were indefatigable in working to save Jews, and many hundreds were sheltered in monasteries and comments in Rome and in Vatican City. In 1945, Rabbi Zoli converted to Catholicism, taking the baptismal name Eugenio after Eugenio Pacelli. So Eugenio Pacelli was Pius XII's uh, baptismal name before he became Pope. And um, Rabbi Zoli, in later interviews, did insist, and um, you know, I, I believe him, I have no reason not to. He did insist that his conversion was a long process. It had started years before the war, and, and it was something he came to on his own uh, with God. Um, so it's not like, it, it's not like um, Pius XII converted him, but of course, as we've already seen, Zoldi was very grateful to Pius XII, and the fact that he took the name Eugenio uh, after Eugenio Pacelli, uh, does mean that this great act of charity and the great witness of Pius XII, his great example, was kind of like that, that one last step in his conversion, or it certainly uh, helped seal the deal. 1945, Moshe Sharet, the first foreign minister and second prime minister of Israel, he says this, I told him, um, he's talking about um, a meeting that he had immediately after the war with Pius XII. I told him that my first duty was to thank him and through him the Catholic Church on behalf of the Jewish public for all they had done in various countries to rescue Jews. Okay, so how can you call Pius XII anti-Semitic? It, it, it goes against all data and all common sense. 1958, Golda Meir, who was the fourth Prime Minister of Israel, she said this on the occasion of Pius's death, 
she called Pius XII a great servant of peace. Pius XII saved an estimated 860,000 Jews, according to Pinchas Lapide, an Israeli ambassador and historian. 860,000? It's a staggering number. And all of this because he was working behind the scenes to organize uh, their rescues, their ransoms, their being hidden, he, doing what he could to, to address the problem. He couldn't overthrow Hitler, but he could save Jews, and that's what he did. So how could Pius XII be accused of collaborating with Hitler? In other words, how could this, this terrible anti-historical and anti-Catholic myth uh, even, even begin? Well, that started in 1963 with The Deputy, which was a play written by Rolf Hawkuth. And critically acclaimed, everyone swallowed its lies. Now, why do people swallow these lies? Well, it's because of anti-Catholicism. And, and some of the anti-Catholicism that we encounter um, does come from the black legend, which was um, an expert bit of propaganda uh, done by, by the English mostly against the Spanish and against the church. So that's definitely part of it. But there's even more to it than that. Um, there's just a resentment of the church, uh, a, a resentment of, of, its, of its moral standards, especially uh, a distrust of the church because it's an old institution uh, run by men. Um, it's, it's, um, there are a lot of things about the church that, um, that invite the criticisms of modern society. And so why am I saying this? I'm saying this because, I'm saying this because uh, even though the deputy it was a pack of lies, basically portraying, portraying Pius XII as in cahoots with Hitler. Um, even though it was a pack of lies, um, people were willing to believe the pack of lies because they already hated the church. Now, qualified historians, prominent Jews, and the Anti-Defamation League all refuted the deputy. And they did a pretty good job of refuting it, um, so that within a few years after the deputy came out, there really wasn't a lot made out of it um, because it had been shot down so thoroughly. But unfortunately, unfortunately, um, you know, people forget. And, and even though history repeats itself and we should learn from history, uh, people forget. And so 30 years later, it was possible to re-spread the lies, and that happened. Beginning in 1999, Hitler's Pope, The Secret History of Pius XII by John Cornwell. The same bogus anti-historical lies. And again, the reaction was that it got eaten up by the mass media and reported as gospel truth. And it's sad um, because, again, real historians took this book apart, shot it down, and made a fool of it. And yet you don't hear about those refutations. 2001, Constantine Sword, The Church and the Jews, A History by James Carroll. More of the same rubbish. And five other similar books were written in the early 2000s. They're just not worth mentioning because they're simply rehashes of the same lies. Okay. These lies do not hold up. Okay. And the reason they don't hold up is because all of all those quotes I showed you, of all the testimonies of Jews who survived the Holocaust because of Pius XII, those are the only facts that you need, okay? Because the claims of these books and the deputy are all utterly ridiculous. Pius XII was a hero, speaking out against Nazism 
hiding Jews all over Rome and the Vatican, and even converting his Castel Gandolfo bedroom into a maternity ward. I mean, imagine this for a second. Okay, Castel Gandolfo is the Pope's summer residence, and and he converted his bedroom into a place where pregnant um, Jewish women could have their their children. Um, imagine the 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 openness. Uh, first of all, he's got them living all over the Vatican room. He, he's got people hidden everywhere where you can hide them. And he converts his own bedroom into a maternity ward. It It's infuriating. To me, it's infuriating that such a heroic example, such a, uh, uh, a profound witness of gospel charity, could be attacked um, with such pernicious lies. The church has always opposed the persecution of Jews. This has always been the official stance of the church. Let's look at what St. Augustine says in Contra Faustus. Whoever destroys Jews in this way shall suffer sevenfold vengeance, that is, shall bring upon himself the sevenfold penalty under which the Jews lie for the crucifixion of Christ. Now, an interesting little thing here, um, you know, Augustine was was still, uh, he, he was speaking according to the thought of his time, and the thought of his time did, you know, lay the blame on the Jews. Um, and we've, you know, we've come away from that understanding, um, I think really for obvious reasons, because to me, just reading the Gospels, we can see that it's not the Jews. It's certain Jews, but not the Jews as an entire people. And yet, you know, Augustine is still, he's still um, echoing the opinion of the time. But even though he's echoing the opinion of the time, he's still saying that, that there is no justification for killing Jews. No justification. In fact, the person who does will bring judgment upon himself. The clearest statement of the church's official position on Judaism is in Nostra Aetate. True, the Jewish authorities and those who followed their lead pressed for the death of Christ. Still, what happened in his passion cannot be charged against all the Jews. Without distinction, then alive, nor against the Jew of today. Although the church is the new people of God, the Jews should not be presented as rejected or accursed by God, as if this followed from the Holy Scriptures. All should see to it, then, that in catechetical work or in the preaching of the Word of God, they do not teach anything that does not conform to the truth of the Gospel and the Spirit of Christ. Furthermore, in her rejection of every persecution against any man, the Church, mindful of the patrimony she shares with the Jews, and moved not by political reasons, but by the Gospel's spiritual love, decries hatred, persecutions, displays of anti-Semitism, directed against Jews at any time and by anyone. So, clearly the Church is not anti-Semitic. Okay, the next historical myth about the church in the dark ages, about this uh, oppressive church, um, limiting learning exclusively to clergy members, keeping the ignorant masses in the dark, stifling science and progress. Okay, the, this ridiculous claim is simply accepted as common knowledge. In fact, the term dark ages, the fact that we accept that term shows how pervasive the lie is because it's a misnomer. They weren't dark ages. And even, even our whole um, way of naming historical periods um, kind of reflects this lie because dark ages, okay, and what happened after them? Well, some, some sources just call the entire Middle Ages the dark ages. Some don't. Some say that ended around a thousand, and then you had the High Middle Ages. But, but then what happened? Uh, well, the Renaissance, the rebirth, as in rebirth of learning, 
rebirth of the intellectual life and the pursuits of uh, the liberal arts. Baloney, that happened during the Dark Ages, and it happened uh, to a great degree. So even the name Renaissance reflects the lies, as if a rebirth were needed. Yes, there was a rebirth of classical antiquity, but that doesn't mean there was a rebirth of like learning in general. Um, or the Enlightenment, right? The highly anti-religious Enlightenment um, was, was a time when, when uh, humanity woke up and saw the light of rationalism and empiricism. Okay, all of this, it, it's really based on lies that are so accepted that we don't even question them anymore. Let's look at what Daniel Borston, who was uh, a prize-winning historian, this is what he said in The Discoverers. Christianity conquered the Roman Empire and most of Europe. Then we observe a Europe-wide phenomenon of scholarly amnesia, which afflicted the continent from AD 300 to at least 1300. This occurred because the leaders of, un, uh, the leaders of Orthodox Christendom built a grand barrier against the progress of knowledge. I mean, where is this guy getting such baloney? 300 to 1300, has he no idea of all of the progress in so many areas of human learning that were made in this thousand year period? But why do you think he was so prize winning? Because he had anti-Catholic positions, all right? and anti-Catholic positions are popular. Cambridge historian J.B. Burry, he says this, Constantine's adoption of Christianity inaugurated a millennium in which reason was enchained, thought was enslaved, and knowledge made no progress. That is a joke. A thousand years of no progress? I mean, has this guy even read a single line of authors who lived during that time? It boggles my mind how such lies can be swallowed. How did this myth begin? Well, it began with the influence of Renaissance humanists and the anti-Catholic Enlightenment. So let's talk first about the Renaissance humanists. It's not that they were all bad guys, I'm not saying that. Um, but I am saying that there was kind of this, um, there's kind of this self-centered uh, or self-congratulatory pride that they had. And I mean, we can see why. It was a time of great achievement and learning and the revival of, of, um, of the classics. But, but that kind of led them to um, an unfair disparagement of the ages that had preceded them. And because they were such good writers and so influential, um, thinking of Petrarch, for example, who was very influential, it, this helped to, this helped to um, make society think that the Dark Ages were really dark. Even worse, though, was the anti-Catholic Enlightenment. So um, these influential authors who were all very much against the church. Uh, they were able to influence society and to get people convinced that, um, that the church was the reason why there was no progress in that thousand year period, which of course is a false statement. But uh, so not only was it a false statement that there was no progress during the thousand years, it's also false that the church caused that lack of progress, but society was willing to accept those lies. Now, let's talk about the facts. So, the first fact is that Romans lived all over the empire. Okay, this was true long before the fall of Rome. Long before the fall of Rome, you had Romans in um, every stretch of land. You had Romans in every city. People who were Roman citizens, right? Just as Roman as, as um, citizens living in Rome, the city itself, and they were spread throughout the whole empire. 
They didn't cease to be Roman when Rome fell. No, they were still Roman. And many Goths were already Romanized, including Alaric, who sacked Rome in 410. Um, and by the way, the only reason he did that is because the Huns were pushing in on the Goths. The Goths needed land. Um, the Eastern Roman Emperor had promised them land, had reneged on his promise, and, and so basically uh, that, that forced Alaric and the Visigoths to take desperate measures. But that's a side note. What matters here is that the Goths, Ostrogoths, Visigoths, all the Goths were already Romanized. Okay? Many of them already served in the Roman army. Many of them had, had Roman educations. Um, they, they spoke Latin. Of course, they spoke their native dialects too. But the, the point is that these weren't, these weren't beastly barbarians. Okay? That is not a correct image of who these people were. Now, when Rome fell to the Goths, who, as I said, were already Romanized, yes, there was less literacy among them. That doesn't mean they were all illiterate. It does not mean that. It does mean, though, that there was less literacy among them <clears throat> and certainly less awareness of Greek thought. So um, a, lot of, a lot of the Goths were really well-educated, but, you know, clueless about Plato and Aristotle and all the great uh, writers of Greek antiqu antiquity. But, but to say that they were completely ignorant barbarians just because they didn't know some Greek authors is, is a ridiculous caricature. They were civilized and many were Christian. Uh, now, Aryan missionaries had been sent um, to evangelize the Goths years before. Uh, so, so the Goths were Christian. Um, yes, they were heretical Christians, but they were still Christians. And, um, and, and this is in stark contrast to the common belief that they were, they were all just a bunch of pagans. It's not true. There were many pagans, but there were also many Christians. So the point of all this is that um, uh, Roman culture did not cease to exist with the fall of Rome. The fall of Rome was not a sudden lapse into barbarism. Yes, the Romans called the Goths barbarians, but that was their pejorative term for the invading enemy. Okay, it doesn't mean that uh, these barbarians were beastly, uncivilized brutes. The fall of Rome was rather a shifting of the population away from large cities. So um, part of that is just because of the way the, the Goths like to live. Um, many of them were farmers. Um, Many of them did not want to be cooped up in cities. And so when the Roman Empire was taken over um, by the Goths, um, it, there, was a, there was a shifting of population. And it doesn't mean that the cities fell into ruin. It does mean, though, that the cities were a lot less populous and certainly um, less glorious than they had been at the height of the Roman Empire. The so-called Dark Ages were a time of unprecedented pro progress in morality, agriculture, technology, music, art, literature, education, and science. And um, what you're about to see um, is many reasons, many objective reasons, why we simply cannot call the Dark Ages dark. And, and um, aside from all that, we most definitely cannot blame the Catholic Church for a lack of progress. First, because there was no lack of progress, there was great progress. And more importantly, because as we're going to see, it was churchmen and people that churchmen had evangelized and the general Catholic society, because that's what most people were, um, you know, eventually by the end of the Dark Ages, the so-called Dark Ages, like, you know, by, by 800 AD at least, time of Charlemagne, by that time, um, the, the whole empire or form, former Roman Empire was Catholic. And what I'm saying is that this, this general culture of Catholicism that we call Christendom, Christendom promoted progress rather than holding it back.
A major force in this progress was Benedictine monasticism. And um, we're going to talk about, about why that's true. So monks withdrew from the world to seek holiness through prayer, work, and community life. Right? This is the monastic ideal. And, and the greatest example of this in the West was St. Benedict. Of course, there are many great examples in the East. Um, but um, we're focusing here on Western civilization and the so-called dark, dark ages of the West. Well, right at the beginning of that, you know, uh, around the year 500, uh, this, this was the time of St. Benedict. And um, his establishment of monasteries transformed Europe. Uh, this is why he was named uh, co-patron of Europe. Um, by John Paul II, because he really was, he really was a patron of society. And let's see why. So these monks, they withdraw from worldly lives, but that doesn't mean that they, they checked out of society and just kind of uh, lived as hermits. It doesn't mean that at all. Okay. Because the monastic ideal promoted by Benedict was, um, was about work doing work with your hands, farming, carpentry, good practical stuff, right? Ranching, building, cattle raising. Um, they were all about working with their hands and living in community, practicing charity with each other, praying to God. What a beautiful ideal of life, right? But it's a grave mistake to think of the monks of this time as hermits because they were not hermits. They were not hermits. They lived in community and uh, more importantly, they reached out to the wider community to teach them. The effects of monasticism on Europe are, are these three very important ones. Improvement of agriculture, preservation of classical writings, and evangelization of the Goths. And um, it's worth commenting on each of these. All right. Improvement of agriculture. Um, the monks would 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 show up to start a monastery in in some forest or swamp. They'd clear out the trees, right? Fill in the swamp, and just transform the land into a farm. And they did this all over the place. And w one of the reasons they did it is um, it was you know their monastic ideal to work and pray. And they did many hours of manual labor every day as part of their service to God, as part of offering their lives to God. But they also, um, as they farmed, they also taught others how to farm. They taught the, the Goths how to improve their farming. The Goths were already farmers. But the ones who came up with the um, best methods and innovations of farming that I'll describe in a few minutes, uh, those those were monks and people trained by monks. So improvement of agriculture was was a huge contribution of monasticism, especially Benedictine monasticism, uh, to Western civilization. Preservation of classical writings. Um, well, uh, I have said that the the Goths um, were were largely unaware of, of Greek thought and. Um, Greek thought itself was not, uh, you know, widely popular at this time. Uh, not really until the Renaissance was it widely popular. But the ones who kept those works going, in other words, the ones who made sure that copies of those classical books still existed were the monks who copied them all by hand. And the evangelization of the Goths, the the, the monks were not content to just live their own holy lives by themselves, but they reached out to their communities um, and, and, and preached more by their example than by their words what it meant to truly live the gospel. And the Goths took notice of this and, and became, became Catholic, so not Arian Christians, but, but Catholics in communion with Rome. And it became Catholic by the hundreds and thousands, um, largely because of the influence of the monks.
So let's talk about all the ways um, in which society progressed during the so-called Dark Ages, which will show us that they weren't so dark after all. First, immorality, the abolition of slavery through sacramental equality and spiritual persuasion. So remember that all societies uh, from very ancient times had slavery. And um, the Roman Empire had slavery. Uh, when Rome fell, there were still many slaves. Um, slavery was just part of life. It was a, a normal institution. Okay. Well, the church was pretty clever about how um, they went about abolishing slavery. Um, because the church has always been against slavery, but we'll talk more about that in the next video. Um, how did the church abolish slavery in the so-called Dark Ages? Well, first it extended the sacraments to slaves, um, saying that, that the slaves should receive all the sacraments. Of course, you know, at the time they, they did not allow slaves to be ordained. Um, that happened later. So they kind of had to work up to that. But slaves were allowed to receive all other sacraments, so they were given sacramental equality. And then once they had sacramental equality, which was kind of like, you know, uh, opening, opening the door to equality, well, then the door was thrown wide open by spiritual persuasion because, you know, these monks who were very well respected by society, and keep in mind, the monks weren't just holy men that people looked up to for their um, example of charity and holiness and closeness to God. The monks were also hard-working manual laborers, all right? Um, the Gothic farmers respected the monks because the monks got their hands dirty. And the monks worked and sweat in the hot sun, just like the Goths did. So, so... Um, it was easy for the monks to influence people spiritually since the, the monks had the people's respect. And the monks were uh, skilled laborers. So the Goths respected them because the monks knew skills such as woodworking and metalworking and um, all kinds of other uh, skilled trades that, um, that the Goths were able to learn from the monks. So it was kind of a natural next step for, for the monks and the priests to, to persuade the Gothic landowners um, that slavery really wasn't the best thing and that freeing slaves was, was a great act of charity. So slaves were freed by the hundreds until, until slavery as an institution um, vanished. Okay, it's an amazing thing that in the early years of the so-called Dark Ages, that is in the century of aftermath um, directly following the conquest of Rome, uh, we have the disappearance, the gradual but complete disappearance of slavery. Progress in agriculture, the heavy plow, okay, the Romans used a scratch plow, which was not very heavy, and so it, it didn't dig up the dirt well, but the, uh, the monks and those trained by them and Catholic society in general. Remember, all of these, um, all these uh, progress or things of progress that I'm about to describe, uh, some of course happened directly by monks, but, but they also happened because of the wider society that the monks helped create, that the church helped create, this wider society called Christendom, in which, in which everyone was Catholic, and everyone, for the glory of God, um, did trades and did useful work. And, and this is something that is, is completely against the common lie, the common misconception that there was no progress during the Dark Ages. So the heavy plow, much better than the Roman sc uh, scratch plow. The horse collar, that's important because... Um, you know, Roman farming used used oxen. The Goths used oxen, but but um, the monks and those trained by the monks uh, found a way to harness horses instead, which they found was more efficient because horses could plow land faster than the oxen. So the horse collar allowed this. Water mills and windmills. 
fascinating development. Uh, Romans didn't need water mills. Romans didn't need windmills. Why? Because they had tons of slaves. Slaves did the work. Well, now this is a society, this is a society in which slavery has been abolished. And so uh, the monasteries and people trained by monks used water mills and windmills. They harnessed um, the current in rivers. Sometimes they created dams and allowed falling uh, water from the dams in order to power water mills. Uh, they harnessed the wind. And they, they did this um, in, in order to replace uh, slave power. Um, better beer, wine, and cheese. All right, this might sound trivial unless you're a great enjoyer of beer, wine, and cheese. Um, but, but improved methods of making beer, wine, and cheese um, began in the monasteries. Technology. Uh, clocks. That's definitely something that came about because of the church and because of monasticism, because um, monks needed reliable ways of telling the time to follow their, their strict prayer schedule. So clocks were developed during the so-called Dark Ages. Chimneys. Um, before the Dark Ages, you just had little holes in the roof to let the smoke out, but the holes in the roof also, you know, let rain and cold in. Chimneys were a Dark Ages invention. Eyeglasses. Better saddles and stirrups. Uh, all right, the Roman cavalry, yes, they rode horses and hacked people with their swords. But the Roman cal cavalry did not have um, deep saddles. They did not have stirrups. So they couldn't, you know, they couldn't drive a lance into the enemy because if they tried to do that, they'd just get knocked off their horses. But, but um, the Goths, and and this whole society of Christendom, right? Both Gothic and Roman in culture, but Catholic in spiritual identity. They came up with with stirrups and deep saddles, because stirrups and deep saddles give you stability. So that if you're in heavy cavalry and you're driving into the opponent with a lance, you don't get knocked off your horse. And this is precisely how Charles Martel won the Battle of Tours. In 732. And we know, and all historians will agree, that if he hadn't won that battle, um, Islam would have completely dominated Western Europe uh, instead of getting only the Iberian Peninsula. Um, but, but in any case, that military development was a Dark Ages development. Uh, sailing ships and cannons. All right, the Romans had uh, the Romans had big ships that were driven by oars, and of course, who powered the oars, the slaves, um, and they had like small square sails to help them uh, harness the wind when they could. But true sailing ships that we envision now when we think of sailing ships, um, true sailing ships are a dark ages invention that made the age of ex exploration possible. Even cannons, um, yeah, gunpowder came from China, but, but the Chinese were using it to well, they were just using it in um, in fireworks. They did have some crude cannons, but mostly fireworks. The 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 society that developed accurate cannons, that society was um, Western civilization, um, which, as I said before, was Gothic and Roman in culture, but Catholic in spiritual identity. This was the this was the milieu in which technological progress could happen. Architecture, the Romanesque and Gothic styles. You know, it's funny, even these terms uh, reflect reflect a lie, but I mean, we still use the terms. I'm not saying we shouldn't use the terms, but it's interesting where these terms come from. Uh, Romanesque was come up with, they came up with that because, um, you know, for anything to have any worth, it had to at least um, be somewhat Roman even though the Romanesque style, as we're going to see, was not uh, Roman at all. Um, and then the Gothic style, like, um, you know, in the so-called Age of Enlightenment, Gothic architecture was looked down on as uh, a relic of, of the Dark Ages. And so um, it, was, it was called Gothic as if, as if backward and barbarian. But, but Gothic architecture, architecture is anything but that. 
uh, it, it's debatably the the greatest and um, most elegant architectural design ever. Painting. Um, painting was transformed during the Dark Ages. Uh, before the Dark Ages, uh, people would only paint on, on wood surfaces or on plaster. You know, they do frescoes and plaster. But, but the Dark Ages saw the advent of painting on canvas. And it also saw emotion put into painting. This was something that was not true of ancient art. Ancient art depicted figures sometimes very well. But the whole drama and, and facial expression and, and, and emotion, putting that in art, was, was a Dark Ages invention, um, starting mostly with Giotto, but, but continuing with other artists. How about literature? Look at all these works of literature. Um, are you, I mean, can you seriously say that the Dark Ages was a time of uh, intellectual stifling? Beowulf, or how about Dante's Divine Comedy, or Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, or The Song of Roland, or El Cid? Uh, all of these were not only important works of literature, but they helped define their respective languages. Okay, Beowulf and Chaucer helped define the English language. Dante helped define the Italian language. In fact, Dante's dialect, the Tuscan dialect, was later adopted as the universal um, Italian language. Because before that, um, Italy was just a whole bunch of dialects. So, so Dante helped define the Italian language. Song of Roland did that with French. El Cid did that with Spanish. So these weren't only important works of literature, but, but they provided the vernaculars in which later great authors were able to write. Education. Right? How can you call the Dark Ages dark when, when the Dark Ages witnessed the rapid rise of the university? The whole university system was produced during this time. Now, again, to be fair, there are some textbooks you'll see that have the Dark Ages listed as Fall of Rome to 800, because 800 was, you know, the golden age of Charlemagne. Some will list it as Fall of Rome to the year 1000. Others will say year 500 to year 1000. Okay. Um, those sources are at least a little more honest. But the first two sources that I showed you, the first two quotes, clearly, I mean, one guy said 300 to 1300. Um, and the other guy said a millennium. Um, clearly, they're just lumping the whole Middle Ages into the Dark Ages. And, and, you know, to say that those were times of no progress when the universities rose during them is completely unfair. Uh, scholasticism, you know, the, the perfect synthesis of philosophy and theology, um, of which Aquinas was the greatest master and Anselm was the, was the first example. Um, but, but the scholasticism that we admire and that has been such a great source of theological truth for us, that began in these so-called dark ages. Science, we discussed that in a previous lesson when, we, when I talked about the church versus science. And in that lesson, we completely debunked the myth because the church is, is definitely... Um, not anti-science, but rather favors science and has helped it grow. But I'm not going to repeat everything that was said in that lesson. Um, suffice it to say that many scientific advancements happened during this time that has been unfairly called the Dark Ages. Music, polyphony began in this time. Um, uh, Gregorian chant, uh, ancient music, it was all monophonic. But but polyphony began during this time and later developed into many other styles. But polyphony is a huge contribution um, made to Western civilization during this period. Now, um, I want to show you, um, there's, this, there's this melody or this song that I really like, uh, Sederum Principes, by uh, one of the great medieval masters, Perotinus. And um, he's sometimes called Perotinus Magnus, or Perotan. But he wrote Sederum Principes in a, kind of an interesting style. 
the way that music used to be, church music, is that they would have polyphony for the first word or two. And then they would go into Gregorian chant for the next few words. And then back to polyphony for the next word or two. So um, uh, what you're about to see, or, well, see and hear, is um, the entire song is just sederunt, right? Three syllables are going to make the entire song that I'm about to play for you. Um, you might think this is weird. Well, it's weird for us because we're not used to it. Um, but this was an important step forward in, in um, the development of music. So just listen to, listen to um, Sederum Principes. Um, if, if it's kind, it is kind of long. I mean, I could just <laughs> listen to it for hours because I think it's really beautiful. But at least listen to the first minute. And then if, um, if you've grown tired of it, you can skip forward to the next slide. Um, or just take this time as a few minutes to chill and listen to some really relaxing and beautiful music. 
I think that's a really beautiful song. And um, you probably noticed that you probably noticed that most of it was, you know, the the first two syllables. So the e eh sound um, that's from sederunt, but the the u came at the very end for for runt. But that entire music you just listened to was three syllables. Um, that's a style. Now the part that I didn't record is the the Gregorian, the monophonic Gregorian chant that that um, comes after it. But that was the pattern: a few syllables of polyphony, a lot of syllables of of chant back and forth, and and that style began during these so-called dark ages. Now we're going to finish this video by looking at some art. So this is kind of a nice way to finish off um, some architecture and art. So the Romanesque style, which is is from these Dark Ages, um, I'm just, <laughs> it sounds so stupid to say Dark Ages now, um, but um, I'm going to keep using the term just because it's become accepted. But I think we can all see that the Dark Ages were not so dark. So the Rom Romanesque style begun at this time. Um, the nave and transept, apse, columns, and side aisles, well, that was already part of the basilica style of, of ancient Roman times. So that was not an innovation. Now, Romanesque churches did have naves and transepts and apses and columns and side aisles, but they also had new, um, unique elements. Um, barrel vaults, thick walls, a few windows, bell towers, and arcades everywhere. That's like the uh, most uh, characteristic element of the Romanesque style is the arcades. And um, let's look at a couple examples of this. So this would be um, a general schematic or layout of a typical Romanesque church. So you got the bell tower here on the left. And some of you might remember St. Andrews. St. Andrews is still my favorite church in the LA area. Just an amazing place. Um, but St. Andrews has a bell tower in the front. And um, St. Andrews actually is a Romanesque church uh, on, on the outside, and it has some basilica elements on the inside. But, but uh, on the outside, St. Andrews is a Romanesque church, St. Andrews in Pasadena. So we got our bell tower over here. Um, we've got our barrel vault. Okay, so this would be a barrel vault. If you look where my mouse arrow is now. Um, it's it's called a barrel vault because it's like a a vault that follows this arch shape throughout. And then you've got arcades. So like these are arcades right here on the bell tower. Arcades are just a series of arches. And then we see the arcades here as well um, at, at this level, the clerestory level, a series of arches. Those those are arcades. Um, there were not a lot of windows in the Romanesque style. Um, and that's just because of structural support. Um, windows took away structural support, so they had to make them small and pretty few and far between. But um, Romanesque churches are beautiful. And um, you probably you probably noticed that um, the, the bell tower, especially here, looks a lot like the one at, at St. Andrews. Cathedral of Pisa is Romanesque. Look at the arcades everywhere. The whole facade is full of arcades and um, not many windows. Um, we can see that. You'll also see in the background the Leaning Tower of Pisa, which is kind of Romanesque too because of all, its, all of its arcades. But um, focusing mainly here on the cathedral. It's a beautiful cathedral. Gothic style. This I like to think of, at least for me, it's the crowning achievement of architecture. Um, it's not the only architectural style, and certainly there are many beautiful um, styles of architecture. Uh, this is my personal favorite. I just think it's really um, the high point, and some of the examples of it are some of the most beautiful buildings ever made. Um, so, nave, transept, apse, column, side aisles. Well, basilica, basilica style, Romanesque style, Gothic style, they all have these, so I'm not going to focus on them. But what was unique about the Gothic style was the pointed arches, uh, the ribbed vaults, flying buttresses, and large stained glass windows. 
Um, the reason you could have large stained glass windows is because pointed arches allowed you to go higher and distribute the force more vertically instead of horizontally. And you could um, support the horizontal thrust with uh, uh, external flying buttresses so that the walls could be less weight bearing in order to include a great deal uh, more windows. Fascinating innovation that allowed um, light to pour in through these amazing stained glass windows. So a classic example of the Gothic style is Notre Dame in Paris. And um, we can see over here, you can uh, see some flying buttresses. Notice how the flying buttresses um, are between each pointed arch window. And so this allows, the pointed arch allows the thrust to be mostly vertical, but the amount of thrust that is horizontal is supported by the buttresses. And so the wall doesn't have to be weight bearing or doesn't have to be as weight bearing. Um, and, so, and another characteristic uh, element is the rose window. Most Gothic cathedrals have this large rose window here um, and um, spires, but uh, really the, the defining elements of the Gothic style, pointed arches, fine buttresses, and stained glass windows, uh, which are results of the flying buttresses. Here's Saint-Chapelle in Paris. Um, so Saint-Chapelle is an amazing example of the Gothic style. Um, uh, this is an interior photo because I wanted to show you what a ribbed vault looks like. So this here is a ribbed vault. And the, um, the beauty of a ribbed vault is it allows you to span a three-dimensional area. And in, in, in order to uh, spread out the thrust vertically, that's what these ribs are doing, okay? So a ribbed vault, unlike a barrel vault, um, is uh, able to get a lot higher. And the reason it's able to get a lot higher is because that thrust is being directed downward or vertically uh, from the single point. Okay, so each rib vault has a point where you could say the weight is concentrated and then it gets distributed uh, down the ribs. Uh, the beauty of this is that everything between the ribs uh, doesn't have to be weight bearing. So you can get higher structures this way and you can also open up spaces for more windows. Chartres Cathedral. Um, now Chartres is in its own town, Chartres. Um, not too far from Paris, about, I think, 80 kilometers. But Chart is really a great example of um, the Gothic style. Look at these buttresses over here. You can see them um, on the right. And then um, we can see the rose window. We can see more buttresses on this side. And then the interior of Chart is, is amazing, just full of light. Cathedral of Canterbury, another example of Gothic architecture. Um, interesting thing here is that um, Cathedral of Canterbury doesn't use flying buttresses. Okay, I'm going to go back um, to this example here. These are called flying buttresses because look at how look at how they jut out from the walls. All right. Well, um, in in Canterbury, these buttresses don't do that, but they're still buttresses. So look, look at this. I'm kind of tracing one now with the mouse arrow. I'm tracing one vertically. Okay. Um, we can see that this is a, a reinforcement. It sticks out from the wall, and it gets successively wider as we go down. But it's not a flying buttress. It's just a buttress. Here's the interior of Santa Maria Sopra Minerva in Rome. Uh, again, we see the ribbed vault. Um, and the rib vault uh, allows us to go higher and to have less weight bearing parts. We see some of the stained glass here. Um, it's a beautiful church in Rome. And now we're gonna take a look at some uh, medieval art. And this would fall during the time of the so-called dark ages that our first authors um, described like 300 to 1300. Um, and even some authors describe the Dark Ages as having lasted until like the 15th century. 
But um, this is from the Scriveni Chapel done by the artist Giotto in Padua, Italy. And I want you to notice how there's some, there's some emotion in the faces. Now, you might say, well, there's not a lot. That's true, but there's definitely more than there was uh, in the centuries preceding Giotto. Uh, like, for example, we see that St. Joseph here looks tired. And we see that Mary is looking upon her child uh, or gazing upon her child with love. Here in uh, the betrayal of Judas, we see the anger in the faces of the guards. We see a kind of concerned, fearful, sinister look in Judas. And in Jesus, we see uh, firm resolve, but, um, but also hurt at the fact that Judas is betraying him with a kiss. In St. Peter over here on the left, we see anger. In the crucifixion, there's uh, more emotion in faces. The angels look sad. And they're sad, of course, because um, Christ is dying. This angel over here is catching some of Christ's uh, blood. And then we see that those who are standing next to the cross are sad. Of course, uh, the Virgin Mary, St. John, uh, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene here is at the feet of Jesus, also with a, a very sad expression. This is the, the deposition or uh, the laying of Christ in the tomb. This is also um, called the Pieta, this moment when Mary holds Jesus in the, or the dead Jesus in her arms. And I like this Pieta because um, earlier Pietas don't, you don't have a, you don't have sadness in the faces. You just have serene looking faces. But Giotto started this uh, tradition of putting emotion in people's faces, and we can really see that clearly here. Uh, Mary Magdalene at the feet of Jesus is always um, Mary, the mother of Jesus, holding, holding her son in her arms. And here's a close-up of that. Um, on the far right, Mary Magdalene's sad face, and over here, um, Our Lady's sad face. So, as we can see from these examples of art, and architecture and all the other things we've talked about. It is a complete exaggeration and lie to call the Dark Ages dark because they were just a transitional time, but they were a time of great progress in many areas.